In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The psalm appointed for this week, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, in the year 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius in Italy erupted one of the more famous volcanic eruptions in history. I think it buried several ancient cities, Pompeii being the most famous, but also the city of Herculaneum was covered with 50 to 60 feet of ash. So they've done excavations in different places and found some fascinating things in the ashes. The home of the father-in-law of Julius Caesar, a guy named, known, a guy known as Piso, was uncovered. It was this huge villa and it had a library that had 2,000 scrolls in it, all burnt to a crisp. There's a scientist named Jens Dopke who is using something called a synchrotron, which uses high energy x-rays and magnets and a blast of photons 10 billion times brighter than the sun to examine these scrolls. I read this article, it's fascinating, it's, it's crazy. What they do is they find traces of either lead or iron that was used in the ink to write on these papyruses and can see the shapes of letters in the midst of this charred disaster and they can figure out some of what was written on these papyri, giving us bits of ancient printed libraries that we never had before. It's a ridiculously slow and expensive process, but that's the kind of things that scholars and scientists get grants for, so yay, scholarship. Out of the ashes, we are able to piece together a world that we didn't really know otherwise. That's my connection with the psalm. Psalm 113 initially has a little bit less of a wow factor than this synchronometer or synch yeah, synch synchrotron. But it really proposes the idea of God doing just that, finding something out of the ashes. It's the kind of psalm that Hebrew students get excited about once they figure out what it is. This discovery, it's... Uh, three precisely balanced stanzas. There are seven verbs that build in the last two stanzas, this biblical number of seven with a progression of, of detailing God's praise. We can't unpack all of that, but it starts off with four calls to praise the Lord in the first stanza that build on each other. Did you hear that? Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun, the Lord, name of the Lord is to be praised. That's good poetry, not the way I read it, but it's interesting that some songs currently that are called praise songs have frequent repetition like this, repeating lines or phrases more than once. Some people criticize contemporary music for doing that. It's just really biblical, like this. We can't take time to fully analyze the whole psalm, but the middle stanza has a great question that the third stanza then answers. So in verses five and six in the middle, who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? Who is like God who would even bother looking down at the sad world that we've degenerated into? 
So what's the answer? He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Dust and ashes. I don't know if you ever think much about dust and ash. Usually to me, it just signals a mess. Dusty places, dirty places, places with ash, evidence of destruction that's happened. Ask the people in California about ash after those horrific forest fires. But dust is what God initially used to bring about life. God formed Adam, a man out of the dust of the earth, and breathed life into him. And you know we're dirt, but with God's breath and his spirit, we come to life. And some days we show that life more than others, I think. We take our lives and God's creation, and sometimes we celebrate, but sometimes we make a mess of it. We use the phrase that we're soiled with sin when things are dirty, it's usually bad, need to be cleaned. We're one month and one day into the semester. I don't know if you noticed that. We started out on a shiny Monday, and now we've passed several, several rounds of sickness all around us, gotten to know each other a little more, settled into our less than shiny selves, and we're hanging on maybe almost for dear life on a Friday after a busy week. Maybe it's not all that bad. There are great bright spots, amazing things happening on campus. People serving tremendously, great things. But what we can produce out of the dust of ourselves in this earth is not anything like God does. In fact, on a really bad day, we might even describe the situation as a dumpster fire. I don't know, I like that phrase. It's about as good a description as you can get for, for something that seems like an absolutely bottom-of-the-barrel, unreasonable mess. A bunch of garbage, and then it's on fire. I was intrigued enough to look it up. The phrase was developed 10 years ago in 2009 on sports talk radio on a Washington, D.C. station, a guy named Mike Wise and and, uh, his his co-reporter Liz Drabeck used it in reference to the Washington Redskins, that they were like a dumpster fire. And now it's pretty widespread. It's fascinating, though, isn't it, that God takes the worst situation and brings life and hope. He kind of used a dumpster fire, an ash heap to save us all. Jesus came into this dirty world of ours, he lived a perfect life, and then died in the most God-forsaken of all places, a garbage pile outside of the city called Golgotha, an ash heap. Now that's the place of all of our hope what happened on that cross. So much so that we trust that when we die and our bodies again become dust, God will bring them together again and give us a glorified body for eternity. And he doesn't even use a synchrotron with high energy x-rays and magnets and a blast of photons 10 billion times brighter than the sun. No, it's his son, his only son, Jesus who brings life. It's interesting that the psalm ends talking about a barren woman being able to have children. The idea of life and family as another gift of God. Even more interesting is that this is one of the traditional psalms that was said at the beginning of Passover celebrations. A family meal 
to celebrate God rescuing his people in the most miraculous of ways from the most hopeless of circumstances, taking them through the water like baptism and giving them new life in the promised land. If you dig a little deeper even, you find that these same words are quoted by Hannah in 1 Samuel when she's barren and then is blessed with her son Samuel. It's an amazing progression in this psalm. Out of dust, there's first physical life, and then there's the abundant life that we get to live on earth, and then there's eternal life. No dumpster fire is too much for God to rescue. So, on the first day of the second month of the semester, God has again rescued us. It's a good day to praise the Lord, maybe even multiple times. In Jesus' name, amen.